Debbie Moran. I am the novice chair for the Houston Astronomical Society, and I learned pretty much everything I know about observing from being a member. I was a pretty good armchair astronomer before then. And uh, we give lots of talks, and there's an awful lot of lingo that happens um, that's very specialized to amateur astronomy. And I finally decided to just do a talk that's like a glossary, just all the weird terms you'll hear thrown about. So instead of learning a lot about one subject, we're going to learn a little about a lot of subjects tonight. And I call this a Learn the Lingo Astronomy A to Z, but I do have it categorized to help you remember things. So we'll talk about terms in certain areas of astronomy, and then we'll go back to the beginning of the alphabet for the next kinds of terms that we're going to learn. And I'm also going to try to make it a little bit fun for you. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. Okay, so I call this Astronomy A to Z, Learn the Lingo. And uh, I'm going to actually start with the two, kind of toward the end of the alphabet, because I think these are two of the most important terms that amateur astronomers need to know when you're out observing, and they are seeing and transparency. Um, your first concern actually would be, is it cloudy or not? But as far as whether to observe and whether it's a good night of observing, what you're concerned about are seeing and transparency. If you have both that are excellent, then you have a really superb night um, under the sky. So what are those? Well, seeing refers to the steadiness of the atmosphere. So if we have bad seeing, it's a little bit like a, looking through a planet, or like a, it's a little bit like looking at a penny in a swimming pool, and the, the currents within the swimming pool or the water are making it shimmer. The atmosphere will do the same thing. And when you're looking through a telescope, especially a large tel aperture telescope, that shimmering in the atmosphere from say something like a cold frontal passage or wind um, will blur the image. When you have very good seeing, then you, the image stabilizes, the air is very still, and, and you can see much more clearly. Houston, with all of its hot heat and humidity like tonight, is actually a very good place for good seeing. Florida is the same. When we have these uh, temperature inversions and it's hot and humid and the air is still, you feel like you can hardly breathe. We often have ex excellent seeing with a very stable atmosphere. Um, so um, good seeing, as far as the weather goes, would come maybe with a temperature inversion. Um, when the warmer air is on top of the cooler air, um, it's a much more stable situation when warmer air overlays cooler air. When warmer air is underneath cooler air, it's constantly trying to rise through that cool air. This is the kind of thing that happens when a cold front comes and you have cool air on top of the existing warm air, and that causes very bad seeing. So if, if it's planets you want to look at, or the moon, this is what's most affected would be solar system objects. You may not want to look at those right after a cold front passes. Now, transparency is how clear the air is, and sometimes these work against each other. When a cold front passes and blows out all the gunk in the air, we actually have excellent transparency. And transparency is especially important when you're looking at deep sky objects, so objects beyond our solar system, like nebulae and galaxies, uh, either objects within our galaxy or objects beyond our galaxy. Those are best when you have excellent transparency. The best of all worlds is to have both excellent seeing and excellent transparency. Um, then you have just an amazing night under the stars, but the weather doesn't often allow for both of those. When you have, a, when you're a, become a ser serious observer, you will be asked to um, to actually log the seeing and the transparency. So the seeing might be on a scale of one to five, and the transparency on a scale of one to ten, with the high numbers being the very, very best. Um, now, averted vision is the uh, is um, this also refers to condition. Averted vision has also to do with seeing well in a telescope. And that is a phenomenon that your eye is most sensitive to light, actually a little bit off-center. So if you look directly at an object, um, you don't see it quite as brightly as if you look slightly away from it and the image of that object is hitting a little bit off-center at the back of your retina. So we encourage new astronomers when they're looking at something that's nebulous and might have some faint areas to move their eye around uh, away from looking directly at the object, and sometimes it will jump out at you. This is called averted vision. You also need to know the teasing types of, uh, of, um, of terms, which are 
perverted vision or averted imagination. When you tell someone that you see all these details in a galaxy and they look in there, they don't see it at all, they will accuse you of having averted imagination or a perverted vision. So let's talk about the terms for finding your way in the sky, the navigating the sky. Um, altitude and azimuth are two terms you need to know. So altitude is how high up from the horizon an object is. And directly overhead is 90 degrees. You're, in, you're looking at kind of a half of a sphere when you look up at the sky. Directly overhead is 90 degrees. Right on the horizon is zero degrees. And um, when this is also important because when you're choosing what object to look at, uh, you often want something that's high in altitude at the time because you're looking through a lot less atmosphere. And that goes back to the seeing. The seeing is better higher up in the sky than it is lower on the horizon because there's a lot less atmosphere to be vibrating. And azimuth is a compass direction. Um, so west, east, north, northwest. And that's one way to think about where objects are in the sky, compass direction and altitude. Um, the meridian and the zenith. So the zenith is the point directly overhead at your location. And the meridian would be a line drawn from north to south that intersects the zenith. And the meridian might be the line up on, along which, as the stars rise and set and objects rise and set, would be the highest point that they will be at that night is when they're somewhere around that meridian. The celestial sphere is how we imagine the stars on sort of a artificial sphere. It's how the ancients imagined it, that you're looking at a, a sphere of stars surrounding the Earth. And we map them kind of in relationship to the Earth. So the celestial equator projects the Earth's equator out onto the stars. Uh, the North Celestial Pole is above our North Pole, and we happen to have a North Star Polaris directly above our North Pole. Um, there is no South Star. We're just lucky to have a bright star directly up, or almost directly above the North Pole. It's about three quarters of a degree off. And we'll talk a little bit about the coordinate system on that celestial sphere in a minute. So um, those we have a coordinate system, which is analogous to latitude and longitude. The right ascension lines, which go from uh, up and down the celestial sphere, are um, equivalent to longitude lines on the Earth. But they are measured not in degrees, minutes, and seconds, but in hours, minutes, and seconds. And that's because not only are they a distance in the sky, but they're also a time. So it actually takes one hour for a star to travel from one hour of right ascension to the next hour of right ascension as it travels across the sky. And that's a, a sidereal hour, which I will talk about in a little bit. Um, declination is measured in degrees, just like latitude and lo latitude degrees are. So you have 90 degrees north at the north celestial pole and nine, minus 90 degrees at the south celestial pole. And the equator is at zero degrees. So the positive numbers are the north part of the celestial sphere and the negative numbers are the south. The ecliptic is the line of sight it's, um, of the Earth's orbit around the sun. And so these red lines, this inner red, red uh, lines, is the Earth's orbit around the sun. And that line of sight is this outer red line over here. And that's called the ecliptic. And it's off center. It's not the equivalent to the celestial equator because the Earth's axis is tilted as it circles the sun. So the celestial, the ecliptic is also tilted 23 degrees to the celestial equator. So this blue line is the equator. The ecliptic is, a, is the red line. That's important because the ecliptic or line of sight to the sun is also line of sight to all of the planets. And the sun and planets can only be in the constellations that are along the ecliptic. And if you look at a star map, which will have a line showing the ecliptic, you'll notice all the familiar constellations you've heard of from the constellations of the zodiac. So we'll go through Gemini and Leo and Taurus and Capricornus and Scorpius. All of those constellations lie here. And those are the only places that the sun, if you could see it, I mean, an eclipse, you can see the sky if it's covered up you will see that it's going to be in a constellation along the ecliptic. Same thing with the planets. So when we had this, quote, lineup of planets a few days ago, last week, 
Um, the, all of those were, the reason they appear to be in a line, they're not, <clears throat> not necessarily really close to each other, but when they're strung out in their orbits and they all happen to be on roughly the same side of the Earth instead of all spread out, they will appear to be roughly in a line in the sky because they can only fall along this red line. <clears throat> So um, our angle is another term which is not often used, but our angle has to do with how far off of the meridian an object is. So if our angle is minus 2 or plus 2, it means it's 2 hours from being directly overhead, either 2 hours until it will be directly overhead or as far overhead as it can go in its, in its, uh, sort of, in its path across the sky or it might be past that. And that's important because if you really want to see an object at its best, you want that hour angle to be zero. You want it to be close to as high in the sky as it can get. Um, arc seconds and minutes. So these are, um, these are measurements that you might use in the eyepiece. So the um, large measurements are uh, the degree uh, takes 90 degrees from the horizon to overhead. But when you're looking at an eyepiece, you may be only seeing a, a part of the sky that's only about a degree wide. So a good rule of thumb is that the full moon is about half a degree. Um, my low power eyepiece is just slightly over a degree. When I look in most of my telescopes, a little bit over a degree. And then if you use a higher eye power eyepiece, you might be looking at a fraction of a degree. So degrees are meant are divided into 60 minutes, and those are divided into 60 seconds. We call them arc seconds because you're actually thinking in terms of the inside of a sphere or of a, it's an angular measurement. And it's nice to have a feel for how big a degree is or a certain number of minutes or seconds are because it'll help you estimate the size of an object that you're looking at in the eyepiece. And I'm not advancing for some reason. Let me see if I can get that to go. Okay, there we go. Now, position angle is something a little bit esoteric. Um, you are often, sometimes you ask to describe a position angle if you're looking at an elongated object. Something like a spiral galaxy that's tilted uh, may look a little bit more linear in the eyepiece, and they may ask you position angle. If you have a telescope where it's very easy to tell which way is north and south uh, by, by moving it in the north-south axis or axis or east-west axis, you can estimate the angle that is lying, that the, um, that the object is angled at. So you have a slanted looking uh, galaxy. You can actually say, well, it's 30 degrees. It's sort of like a um, 30 degrees off of going north-south. And that helps people know that you're looking at the right object, that it's the, it is in actually the correct um, orientation in the sky. Sidereal time is uh, how long it takes the Earth to face the same star. So it takes us 24 hours to turn once and face the sun, but that's actually a little bit longer than it takes to turn around and face a, a much more distant star. That's because to face the sun again, we are close enough to it that as we're rotating, we've also moved a little bit along our orbit. We actually have to rotate more than once a little bit to face the sun again each day. That's not true with a distant star. It's so far away that effectively the Earth rotates exactly once to face a star. And so a sidereal day is four minutes shorter than a solar day. So it's about, uh, it's more like 23 hours and 56 minutes versus 24 hours. So when we talk about an hour of right ascension, that's, an, that's a sidereal hour. Now let's go to star charts. I'm going to start with one that's obsolete but beloved. I recommend if you can find any that are used that you get these. Uh, for a while they went online. I think they may have disappeared entirely, but this is called Astro Cards. And what I like these for is that they, you could hold something in your hand. It would show you kind of a wider field view of what constellation you're looking at and then show you a view on the right side of how things might appear in the eyepiece. And, and then help you find out what all of the, the field stars are for whatever you're looking at. Find the Constellations by H.A. Ray is probably one of the best books for learning the constellations, even though it's written for children. Then there are uh, various star atlases. 
you want to get a star atlas that does not go very deep in magnitude if you're using either a very small telescope or binoculars, something like a telescope of a few inches in aperture. I'll describe aperture later um, because it won't confuse you with more stars than you're going to see. But you can also see have atlases that show you more and more deeply into the sky as you're using larger and larger telescopes. The Norton's atlases are especially a good balance for showing you the major constellations on a large enough scale that you can easily find them, and then some of the brighter objects that you can just operate off of an atlas like this. Um, then you, there's the Wiltirion Sky Atlas, and these are all paper atlases. I should mention that a lot of people don't even use paper atlases anymore. This one goes more deeply into the sky. Uranometria is, goes even more deeply. It's great for when you're using a large telescope, and each of these squares is like a, um, is just a, is a very small part of the sky. But now we have astronomy apps and, and we have computer atlases also. These are two of the best. And these also will be sort of a, a computerized atlas and very, very customizable. Pre now let's talk about precession, which also applies to atlases and explains why they need to change every 50 years or so. So the Earth's axis is not static. It's tilted 23 degrees, but it also precesses. So it wobbles like a top or like a gyroscope, although very, very slowly. It takes about 26,000 years to go one revolution. And then there, on top of that, there's a little wiggle within that, uh, within that spin due to the, um, the moon's gravity acting upon the Earth. And what that means effectively is that the whole um, grid, where we, the way we plot the stars, shifts gradually, enough that every 50 years we need to publish new atlases. I believe with computerized atlases that's starting to happen more real time, but uh, your coordinates will actually be off. Your right ascension declination numbers will be off uh, significantly enough 50 years later to need a new atlas. So we have what we call epochs. So I started out in astronomy with the Norton Atlas on the left, which is the EPIC 1950 Atlas. And about 20 years ahead of time, they published the 2000. This one they'll probably keep until about now, probably another two or three years. We will come out with the maybe 10 years. Eventually, we'll have the 2050 EPIC Atlases. So let's talk about telescopes now. Um, one of... Uh, uh, a term is alt as, which is short for altitude azimuth. We explained what altitude and azimuth were at the beginning of the talk. Um, so a very simple telescope like the one on the left, which is a Dobsonian design, just goes up and down in altitude and side to side in azimuth. And it throws out all of those coordinate systems that we talked about, which are key to the celestial equator and the Earth's equator and our north celestial Pole. So we call that an out as telescope. It's very, very simple. It doesn't have a mechanism to follow the sky. So when you look at an object, it's going to move slowly while you're looking at it. And then there are other telescopes, um, and this is before computerization. We now have advanced beyond this, but there are other telescopes that are equatorially mounted. So their mounting mimics or the equator of the Earth. And uh, it actually tilts the telescope so its base is aligned with the equator. And that allows the telescope to turn on a single turntable or on a single axis to follow the motion of, of, a, of a star. If it's just mounted on the ground, that only works at the North Pole and the South Pole. And then you just turn the telescope. But any place else on Earth, you have to move the telescope up and down also. So this is an equatorial mount on the right. There's also, I hear the term GEM, G-E-M stands for German Equatorial Mount, which is just a particular style of equatorial mount. And uh, people like these because they allow different types of telescopes to be mounted on top and for the balance to be able to be adjusted right. You do need a telescope to be balanced, um, so it needs to sit so that no matter where you're pointing in the sky, up or down or side to side, it wants to stay there. If it has something very heavy hanging on it, which makes it want to continue to move, that's a problem. So your, teles your, your telescope and the mount have to be matched, and the weight on the telescope has to be matched such that 
things will stay put no matter where you put the telescope. John Dobson is the person who invented the Dobsonian telescope, and he was a sidewalk astronomer. He lived in, I think, to be about 96 years old. He died a few years ago, or a number of years ago. And he revolutionized astronomy by making the larger aperture telescopes, and I'll discuss that in a minute, much more affordable. So simple design, that out as design, and no expensive mechanism for following the sky. And when he did that, telescopes got bigger and bigger. It was also possible to more easily make a telescope at home. And so what astronomers were able to see just advanced by leaps and bounds, because it used to be very, very expensive to get a very large telescope on a German equatorial mount. We now have what we call go-to telescopes. Go-to meaning that you can, that they are run often by GPS and by satellite and by computer. And you don't have to know the sky necessarily very well. You do need to set it up. It needs to know where a couple of stars are at the beginning of the evening, or it uses its own internal GPS to know where it is. And with these, all you, you have a hand paddle, and you just tell it where, what object you want to look at, and it can find it all by itself. They dispense with the equatorial mounts um, because their computers can adjust the telescope in both axes. To, f to follow a star. Now we can talk about refractors versus reflectors, which are two basic de designs of how the telescope gathers light. A reflect refractor in the upper picture uses a lens to see, to gather the light and to bend the light and, and to bring those light rays, no matter where they hit on the lens, together to one point. And the telescope tube will be roughly the length of time it takes for those light rays to come together to a focus. We also now have reflecting telescopes which use a curved mirror instead of a lens and they can often use multiple mirrors to, to focus the light so that we can make the tubes a little bit shorter instead of uh, one long skinny tube. And um, so in this case we have a primary mirror that the, this is a Newtonian telescope down here, that the light first hits and a secondary mirror that reflects it out toward an, an eyepiece on the side. And there are many other designs that use mirrors. Focal length is, a, it simply means the distance it takes from the time light rays hit the focusing surfaces, whether it's a, a, a mirror or a lens, to the point that they come to a focus. And so they can have longer focal lengths or shorter focal lengths, depending on what you're trying to do with the telescope. A longer focal length usually has a narrower field of view, uh, sometimes a little bit more resolution. A shorter focal length has a wider field of view and is often preferred for deep sky objects. The longer focal length is often preferred for things like double stars and planetary observing. The focal ratio is the um, ratio between the what we call the aperture or the diameter of the of the mirror or the lens and and that's divided by the focal length. So a focal ratio tells you a lot about how long the focal length is compared to the width of the or the diameter of your light gathering surface. And again, the, uh, if it's a small number, f4.5, that means you have a shorter tube and a wider field of view. And if it's a bigger number, like f8, it means you have a longer tube or a longer distance and, and a narrower field of view. Chromatic aberration. So lenses have um, some errors in them that you often have to add another lens to correct. And so the problems with the very simple refractor or the very first ones that were made where it was a single lens is that the different colors of light, uh, when, when they're bent by glass, they bend different amounts. So blue bends differently from a red, red light and you would end up with kind of a rainbow of colors and a little bit of fuzz around an object if you don't add lenses. So that's called chromatic aberration. A spherical aberration is kind of the same thing. A, a spherical mirror does not actually put everything exactly in the right place to focus. Uh, normally you have to do more of a parabola shape to have all the light rays come to the same point for a nice sharp image. Coma is a is something that's common in these short focal ratio telescopes um, f4.5 
without added glass and eyepiece. So what will happen with the simple eyepiece is in the center you'll have nice crisp pinpoint stars, but the ones along the edges will be elongated. And the name coma comes also from the name for comet. Um, actually, the coma is the outer glow of, of a comet, but uh, they chose the name coma because of its comet elongated comet shape. So coma has two, two meanings. Um, aperture, which I probably should have put earlier in here because it's, first of all, it starts with an A and we need to know about it. Aperture is the diameter of the mirror or the, or the lens that you're pointing at the sky. And the bigger the diameter, the more light it can gather and the brighter objects appear. So this is Larry Mitchell with his 36 inch aperture. This is again allowed by Dobsonian's designs. Normally a person would not be able, an ordinary person would not be able to afford a 36 inch aperture telescope with older designs, but this is within the realm of what people can buy these days, if, as long as they can buy the vehicle to carry it also. So um, what we've, I start out with a five inch telescope. I, now I have an eight and then I finally bought an 18. That's called aperture fever. After you first get your small telescope, you look at all the bright, bright, splashy things in the sky. Then you start wanting to look at more things. You want to see the spiral arms and the galaxies better. And you kind of keep inching up. Um, so we teasingly call that aperture fever. A uh, primary versus a secondary mirror is pretty much what it sounds like in a, in a, um, in a mirror system. The first mirror that's hit is called the primary. And the second mirror, which is often a straight mirror tilted, is called the secondary. So first mirror hit, primary, second mirror is secondary. The primary mirror is the one that actually has all the shape that focuses the light. Um, collimation, for this type of telescope I just showed you, those mirrors have to be exactly aimed to work with each other. And if they're not, you, there are little adjustments on those mirrors. So when you collimate a telescope, the way to tell whether it's collimated or whether you have good collimation is you take a star, these concentric rings are actually a star, and you take your focus knob and you defocus it um, greatly. And if the concentric rings look very concentric, then you have a well collimated telescope. If they look like the picture on the right, it's not collimated. And there are, um, there are little screws or thumb screws on your mirror so you can move them. And there are tools to do that to bring your telescope back into collimation. This is most important in Newtonian telescopes, which is similar to that Dobsonian design I showed you, and the mirror, the primary versus secondary mirror design I showed you. The eyepiece magnifies the image of the telescope. The telescopes gather the light, but the eyepiece uh, chooses a magnification at which you want to see it. So those are interchangeable. You don't have to. When they talk about a telescope being a certain power, um, first of all, it's often inaccurate. Uh, a telescope's best effective power is, uh, is, is limited. So after a certain point, everything will look blurry. Um, so you want to get eyepieces that are well matched for what your telescope can do. Simpler eyepieces have fewer pieces of glass. And that they add lots of pieces of glass into more complex designs to do things like see a lot of magnification, very wide field. Normally when you magnify, the piece of sky you can see gets smaller and smaller. But there are now specialized eyepieces like these ethos eyepieces on the right, which add extra pieces of glass. They're he bigger and heavier and much more complex, much more expensive. But they give you a, a, the possibility of looking at something well magnified but with plenty of, of room around it. So it feels a lot less claustrophobic when you're looking in the telescope. Eye relief, different eyepieces have what we call eye relief and that is how forgiving is that eyepiece as far as exactly where you put your eye to see it. Normally lower power has better eye relief and which is easier with when you're showing the sky to little kids in very high power unless it's a wide field eyepiece. You must put your eye very precisely um, and, and a, not too far away from the eyepiece to see what you're looking at. Exit pupil is how wide that shaft of light is that exits the eyepiece. And so often um, people, if you buy a telescope and eyepieces, they will help you not get, there's no point in getting an eyepiece where the shaft of light that comes out 
is actually wider than your pupil. And as you get older, the ability of your pupil to expand and when you're dark adapted shrinks down. So seven millimeters is kind of a nice average, um, average of diameter of a pupil. It can get up to maybe nine if you're a younger person. And so the exit pupil is, is that. And again, as you can see, if you don't have your eye in exactly the right place, if you have a very negative, very um, skinny exit pupil, like on the left of that picture, um, then you're not going to see the object. You have to be very well precisely placed. Filters are can be either colored for observing planets to so bring out different details in the planets, or they can be what we call neutral density to look at the moon, which is basically like putting sunglasses on your eyepiece. If you're looking close to the full moon, it can be awfully bright. There are also other filters such as the O3, which stands for oxygen. Three um, filter, which is great for planetary nebulae. It, it filters oxygen, the oxygen lines in the spectrum. Or we have light pollution filters or other filters, which um, what they do is they basically darken the background sky. So um, in a somewhat light polluted sky, the deep sky objects have better contrast. The hydrogen alpha filter is specialized for solar telescopes. And so what it, what it does is it brings out uh, only a couple of lines of hydrogen alpha lines. And you're able to see all sorts of details that you would not normally be able to see on the sun. So you can see the, what we call the granulation, of the, the, which are all these little kind of grains of sand on the sun are, are each individual columns of heated uh, plasma coming up and then falling back down from the surface of the sun. You can see the prominences and flares, solar flares on the edge of the sun. And the um, sunspots, instead of being dark, are these kind of light disturbed areas. You also, every telescope has a finder, and the finder telescope um, is like a, either a small magnifying finder, which is about the equivalent of magnification you might have using binoculars on the sky, or some of them just have or don't magnify at all, but sort of put a target on the sky. And if you're a new astronomer, one of the first difficulties people have or sometimes don't know is that that finder needs to be exactly aligned with your telescope. And there's a, a way to do that. Sometimes it's easier to do during the daytime. And we have a whole talk about how to set up your telescope that's on our website called, I think it's basically how to set up for night observing or how to set up your telescope. And we tell you exactly how to align the finder. The most frustrating thing is if you look, see something in the finder and then it's not in your telescope and you're wondering what's wrong, it's often because they're just not aimed at exactly the same spot. And there's ways to adjust that. This is the well-known Telrad, um, which is a very simple, easy to use finder. Um, you have to have very good kind of spatial relations of ability because you're basically just looking at a piece of the sky. I find a lot of objects just by creating a shape of a triangle with two bright stars I can see and what the object I'm looking at, where is it in relationship to those two bright stars? I aim my tail rat at it and use a wide field eyepiece and hope that it's in there to find it. And that, that works surprisingly well with a lot of bright objects. Um, the focuser is a mechanism that's a, a circular knob, um, sometimes different shapes on different telescopes, but here it is. This gold and this black are the two focusers. The gold one is a fine, fine focuser, um, meaning that it just focuses slightly, and the black one is a focuser. When you use them for a new astronomer, when you wiggle that knob, you'll notice that the um, eyepiece, which is here on the right, will move up and down. So telescopes can actually be focused for your personal vision. You don't, if you wear glasses and you want to take your glasses off, you can look in your telescope and focus it for you. If you don't have very good vision, it won't be very good for anyone else you're showing, and you'll have to show them how to focus. But once you find an object, you also need to be sure you know how to focus it by, uh, by using those fine-tuned knobs. schmidt cassegrain telescope is a different design. Um, which uses, uh, uh, actually it, had, it, it feeds the light through three times. So it hits a mirror on the bottom. It hits a, um, sorry, actually there's three surfaces. It hits a corrector plate first, which is this outer piece of glass. And we call it a corrector plate because it slightly alters the rays of light 
to work with the other two mirrors in the telescope. Then it hits a mirror at the bottom, then it gets partly light, it gets partly focused, and it hits a smaller mirror here, which makes an obstruction in the telescope, and then it finally goes back down to the bottom. So this telescope can be only one third the length that takes to focus the light, and it's very compact and easy to take in a car. Um, so the terms that go with that are well, schmidt cassegrains corrector plate as opposed to a lens or a mirror, and also a visual back is something that screws into the bottom end of it, and that's what will hold um, your eyepieces. That's a way to connect the eyepieces or a camera or anything else that you're connecting to it. Going, I added a little bit of astro imaging. We've gone beyond film photography now, which people used to do. And this is already becoming obsolete. This is a charge coupled device. But I wanted to bring it up because it completely changed the way we used imaging to collect light. So a charge coupled device um, has, has a, um, a receiving plate, which basically is a grid where it measures how many photons of light are, are hitting the surface and turns those into electrons and basically counts those electrons and turns that into, or into, a, um, into an image. We now have its successor called CMOS, Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, which has the same basic operation but is much faster and also much less noisy. And um, I don't quite understand exactly how it works, but again, it's a very different mechanism from the way film used to, to make photographs. And it's now revolutionizing imaging. So I hope he's all right with it. I just stole this off of our Facebook page, or our private Facebook page for the Houston Astronomical Society. This is the kind of images now that amateur astronomers are able to do. And this usually involves taking many images over a long period of time. If I understand, I'm not an imager myself. Often combining images, using a computer to process them, and the images that are coming out are absolutely spectacular now. Um, let's talk about um, seeing things. So first of all, what is an asterism versus a constellation? So we're back into the stars. A constellation is the um, features seen by a culture in the sky, and many cultures made up pictures in the sky, but the ones that professional observers use and which has now been standardized are the stories in the sky that the Greek and Roman astronomers or, or cultures came up with. And so within a constellation, though, there can sometimes be an asterism, so a very strong shape, which is not actually the entire constellation. So the Big Dipper, which is the most famous, is actually a piece of the Great Bear. And the teapot of Sagittarius, which looks very strongly like a teapot, is part of a much more amorphous constellation Sagittarius, uh, which does not look a lot like an archer. As you can see, it's just a vague outline of an archer. So asterism versus constellation. Those are naked eye asterisms. There are also asterisms you can see in binoculars, such as the coat hanger, which is in, in Cygnus, the swan. Um, and it looks exactly like a coat hanger. Or we have a member of our club who's now discovering asterisms, which are actually getting recognized by, by officially. And this one he calls spindle top, but it's sort of a letter A. And th these are telescopic asterisms. So just a group of stars making a very strong shape. Um, I learned a new word when preparing for this talk called Lucida, and it's the brightest star in a constellation. Most constellations um, use Greek letters to, uh, to um, label the stars with alpha being the brightest, and then you just keep going down the alphabet. The, on the only exception is the Big Dipper, which actually labels the stars in order of occurrence in the Dipper shape. Um, you will hear the term Messier objects often if you're a new astronomer. Charles Messier uh, cataloged all these objects in his quest to find comets, and so what he did was he um, when he would found something that didn't move several hours later, later, he wrote it down, and these objects are some of the brightest and most beautiful nebulae to look at in the sky. So they include all sorts of different types of objects, and they are the ones that we recommend new astronomers look at when you first get a new telescope, because they're relatively easy to see. Okay, um, the types of objects you can see, uh, let's start with a galactic cluster. This is one of the easier types, and this is a 
or it's sometimes called an open cluster. This is just a group of stars up to maybe 80 to 120 stars, which are all kind of brothers and sister stars, and they all form from the same uh, gas cloud. And now the gas has been used up and the stars are still hanging out with each other. They look like glitter in the eyepiece. There are one or two, there's actually a couple of naked, maybe three naked eye asteroids, uh, sorry, open clusters, uh, the most famous of which is the the Pleiades, but second to that is the Hyades cluster, which is actually the head of the constellation Taurus the Bull. This V shape is the closest open cluster to us. A globular cluster is quite different. These are very old stars, which are with circle, are kind of in a halo around our galaxy. They're not within the spiral arms. So there are maybe 270 of these above and below the plane of the galaxy. It's still a little bit of a mystery how they form, but the stars are mostly very old, possibly dating back to when the galaxy formed, and either left behind as the galaxy condensed or ejected. I think that still hasn't been resolved. On the right is the beautiful um, globular cluster M3 near Baotes. And uh, I don't think it's actually technically in it, but it's, that's the way I find it. A planetary nebula has nothing to do with planets, but the very first ones found um, they can often be just a small greenish disk, and they were said to resemble the planets Neptune and Uranus back then because they're green or aqua color. And um, in a small, most telescopes, you can sometimes see the smaller ones have some color. Larger ones, this is a photograph of the Dumbbell Nebula M27, but visually you would see it as more of a whitish, ghostly white in an eyepiece. But these are stars about the size of the sun that ran out of fuel in the middle, started burning fuel farther out, became a red, went through the red giant phase. And as they started running out of more and more fuel, um, they become more, more and more unstable, uh, doing a series of expanding and collapsing, and eventually collapse, leaving behind a white dwarf. I should have put, made the slide, but white dwarf in the middle. And, uh, and then the planetary nebulae is the outer layers, which exploded outward. Um, of variable stars, and we have people who make an entire practice of watching only variable stars and measuring as they brighten and uh, get faint. These are stars that change brightness periodically, and for a number of different reasons. Algol is, is the most famous naked eye variable. You can actually see it. You don't need a telescope to notice it's getting brighter and fainter. It's just right in one of the main stars in the constellation Perseus. And this is an eclipsing variable. So the reason it changes brightness is one star is going around another. And sometimes they combine brightness, and sometimes one blocks out the brightness of the other, and it dims. Um, now we've got to talk about some solar system terms. Um, the inner planets are the inner rocky planets going out to Mars, and the outer planets are the gas giants. And we've lost Pluto entirely, so we can say all the outer planets are gas giants. That's not to be confused with the inferior planets and the superior planets. The inferior planets are the ones inside Earth's orbit, closer to the sun, so just Mercury and Venus, and the superior planets are the ones outside Earth's orbit. And that has a number of implications. So for one thing, the inferior planets, Mercury and Venus, can have phases. And if you look at them in a telescope, they will have phases because they are the only planets that we can see their backsides or their nighttime sides as they go around the sun. And what this means is when Venus is especially bright, it's actually becoming a very large crescent. And when it's fainter, it's actually becoming a much smaller disk because it's farther away from us. And the same thing with Mercury, which never gets terribly bright. Uh, the inner planets can also, from our point of view, transit the sun. And this is a big event. They're rare. We've uh, seen the last transit of Venus in our lifetime. I'm afraid there's no more chances for most of us who are alive now. Uh, the next transit of Mercury is November 12th and 13th, 2032. We had one in 2019. So those are kind of fun because it'll take several hours to see the planet transit go across the sun. And you see a black dot just moving across. Um, conjunctions, here's a number of um, terms which describe our relative, um, a planet relative to us and the relative position to us and the sun. So starting with conjunctions, conjunctions are a planet that's in line of sight for, between Earth and the sun. 
The inner planets can have both an inferior conjunction, so the planet is between us and the sun, and a superior conjunction, the planet's on the far side of the sun. Obviously at these times, unless you're having a transit, those planets are invisible, cannot be seen. Um, the maximum western elongation and master, maximum eastern, elonga eastern elongation are times when these inner planets would have, or inferior planets would have, would be half lit, and the, the implication of that is they are, have, are the most out of line of sight with the sun. So they're about as high in the sky as they're going to get and a little bit easier to see. And you can see them for longer during those periods of time. Um, anywhere else on their orbit, they're closer and closer to the sun. And this explains also why Venus and Mercury are never seen very far away from sunrise or sunset. The, su the superior planets we talk about them having conjunctions, so on the far side of the sun from us, and obviously that's not a time to observe them. Opposition is the best time to observe them, so that's when they're opposite us from the sun. It means that they are up all night long. They're directly overhead at midnight, and it's also when they will appear largest in our telescopes. So we will have uh, coming oppositions of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Saturn is in September. Uh, so the autumn is going to be a very good time for observing Jupiter and Saturn. And then the terms western quadrature and eastern quadrature, you can see again, you have kind of this right angle uh, look to, to where that is. So um, again, as these get lower and lower, uh, pretty right now, for instance, uh, Saturn is very low at, um, at the beginning of the evening. So it's just rising in the east. Um, I have a, I'm going to explain retrograde grade motion. If this thing will work, um, I found a really good video to explain it. Let me see if it will start for us. And it has no sound. So about every 18 months to two years is really the best time to look at Mars. They're not stopping it at opposition. Opposition, we would be very close to each other. And Mars is small enough that it's not at opposition. It gets kind of be very small in the telescope. But uh, every once in a while, when we, since we move faster than the outer planets, we pass them up. And what happens is that as we pass them, the path of the planet appears to go backwards in the sky for a period of time. And that's called retrograde motion. And then we kind of start to, uh, that resolves itself and it appears to be moving against the stars the way it normally would. Now it's going to show what it looks like in the sky. And this goes, this is uh, obviously go, dates back to 2009, 2010. So that's retrograde motion. Uh, planetary conjunction is when two planets just happen to be close together in line of sight. And we had a beautiful one at Texas Star Party um, just uh, in this past May of Venus and Jupiter. Eclipses versus occultations. This gets very confusing, especially when we have um, uh, events with Jupiter's moons. An eclipse is when a shadow falls on top of, of on an object. An occultation is when the mass, when, when one object appears to pass in front of another object. Both of them are a lot of fun to observe. I like uh, both eclipses and occultations because you also perceive motion in the sky at those times. And uh, this is an old slide, but we did have a more recent total lunar eclipse. Um, these are organizations you might want to get to know. The Astronomical League, which any member of the Houston Astronomical Society is automatically a member of, and one of its best uh, uh, 
benefits is that it has lots of observing programs. If you're interested in observing planets in detail, you want to join ALPO, Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, AAVSO, for if you're a variable star observer. IOTA is for people who like to time occultations. And the International Dark Sky Association is for people like me who like to fight light pollution. Uh, light pollution is the term for light that's pointed upward, which disturbs the sky and does us very little good here on the ground. And it works like a pollutant. It both obscures the sky and also disturbs health. The solution is warm light pointed downward. This is Flagstaff, Arizona. You see just fine on the ground. And only six miles away, they have a very starry sky at Lowell Observatory because everybody does that. Every man, woman, child, business, home, points its light downwards and uses a warmer color. Um, there's some websites here which I can leave on for just a minute if you want to take a, uh, take a screenshot. I love time and date for animations of eclipses at your location and also for finding out what time sunrise and sunset or moonrise and moonset is at your location. Anyway, these are great general astronomy sites. And now I, now I have a little bit just for fun, um, Honey's Vorwerp, which I, I will tell you a little bit about, about a little bit later, Tabby Star. Syzygy just means a lining up of objects, especially if it involves the moon and the sun. Um, quasars are amazing objects which are incredibly bright for their size. Maybe even the backside of black holes, who knows, but incredibly energetic objects, very, very distant in the sky. They are sometimes gamma ray bursters, which are some of the most um, energetic types of explosions in the, in, the, um, in the universe. And they may be either collisions of neutron stars or incredibly energetic uh, supernovas. And if one were pointed at the Earth, it would probably cause a mass extinction. They've only been seen a few times in distant galaxies. And Ain't No Object I'll, is a nod to Barbara Wilson and Larry Mitchell, who came up with uh, they were they're, um, very dedicated visual observers, and they decided with larger aperture telescopes, they decided rather than using them to see big splashy objects as big and bright as possible, let's see if we can see objects that used to be out of reach of the amateur astronomer. So ain't no was sometimes one that they just thought, well, there's ain't no way you'll see it. Um, this is Tabby's star, which is an incredibly fluctuating um, and brightness star, and it might be due to debris from other comets. And this is um, Honey's Vorwerp, which uh, this is a woman in, who was doing the Galaxy Zoo Citizen Science, and they were supposed to be uh, cataloging galaxies, and she came across one she didn't know how to catalog. It had this strange material outside the galaxy that was glowing kind of greenish blue and it's been studied now they think that what happened it might have been even in the past but a very energetic um, black hole which this which when as things fall into it it, uh, it emits energy very strongly in a certain direction might have happened to have run into a pocket of gas and ionized it and um, I did find out how to pronounce it from honey herself on the internet, I'm Honey Van Arkel and I discovered a new class of object in space which is called Honey's Bulwerp. And I've had the idea for this video on how to pronounce the Dutch word Bulwerp for a while now actually when I still thought that the English speaking world might need it, but truth is, they don't. You don't. So this is basically for all those Dutch people out there who keep commenting everywhere that the English lots are getting it wrong. But and for Whoops those English lots who are wondering what my opinion is on the matter. So, first of all, what is a warp besides this mysterious cloud in space? In Dutch, it's used for an object which you can touch usually and it's not very big. These items on my desk are all good examples. Ding, or the Dutch word ding, would be a good synonym. And so would the Dutch word object, although that's usually used for bigger objects. Why isn't your discovery called object then? Frequently asked question number two. The answer is that when I discovered it, nobody knew what it was, and an English guy on a forum gave it this pet name. He translated the English word object and got Warwerp. The name stuck even on the official papers, which I still think is funny. So, how to pronounce it then? You've heard me say it a couple of times now, and in presentations I do worldwide, I do use the more English accent way of saying it, 
than I would when speaking Dutch. It got the pet name Honey Zvoorp. Honey Zvoorp. And they started calling it Honey Zvoorp. So if you ask me, Zvoorp is fine really. But to be complete and for all those pendant Dutchies out there, I'll try to switch to the Dutch sound. Here goes. Zvoorp. Zvoorp. So there's more R in there. And the E sounds more like the A in trap. Some people say that the Dutch W sounds a bit more like the English V, but I'm not convinced about that. While we're at it, yes, the plural of voorwerp in Dutch is voorwerpen. We do have the S endings for some words, just not for this one. Do I mind the English speaking world saying voorwerps? On the contrary, and neither should any Dutch person out there as we borrow and change words from other languages all the time. I mean, wifi? Seriously? We also have a word for smaller versions of voorwerps because we also found them in space and they go by the nickname voorwerpjes. And there we have the plural S. This leaves us with one voorwerp, één voorwerp, two voorwerps, twee voorwerpen, one little voorwerp, Een voorwerpje and two little voorwerps, twee voorwerpjes. Now that's settled, if there are still English people watching, you're really doing fine on the voorwerp part, but you are kind of messing up my name a bit actually. Um, it's honey, pronounced like honey. I should know, I've been hearing it all my life, but it doesn't have that same meaning in Dutch. Um, anyway, so not so much like honey, honey, because that's my dad's name actually just for the record. So, honey's boar then, all right? Thanks for watching. And then probably we should end with this word, which I think all of us astronomers should, would appreciate, numinous, describing an experience that makes you fearful, yet fascinated, odd, yet attracted, the powerful personal experience of being overwhelmed and inspired. I think that applies to all of us. And um, so that was a few terms, only 4,200 more items to go. And I'm going to stop my share, see if you guys are still out there. And I'm going to allow you to unmute. So let me go ahead and do that. If anyone has any questions or comments. Well, Debbie, I think you should take a breath, OK? <laughs> that was a long song, That's wasn't it? Lot. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a lot of terms out there, aren't there? Debbie. Yes. I uh, am. I'm a complete novice. Yes. This. I am not certain how I even found this thing. <laughs> how you found us, the club, or? Yeah. Well, th this is a place to come if you're a complete novice. Um, we have lots of help for, for new people. So that includes out at the observing site. Uh, I've had a lot of people help me when I had my first telescope. And we have a lot of talks um, for beginners uh, of all sorts of different topics. So if there's anything you need to hear before I get to it or before one of our speakers get to, to it, you go to astronomyhouston.org and log in as a new member, as a member, and you will see on the right side a box that says to go to recorded HAS presentations. And so we have all sorts of topics, how to, buy, how to choose a telescope, how to set one up, um, how to operate certain types of telescopes, and uh, what what you're observing means, just all sorts of things. So we, we're glad to have you. Okay, I'm glad to be here as well. I, I bought a telescope once, in Langhorn, it was a few years ago, but um, 
what what kind should I buy For if I buy another one? You know, if you buy, you're talking about Sky Atlas. Um, if you buy, if you buy only one, I like Norton's. Uh, it's just, it's kind of the the Goldilocks just right Atlas. It has big enough field of view that you can kind of relate constellations to each other. To learn the constellations, I like, if, if you're new at that, I like H.A. Ray's little paperback book called Find the Constellations by H.A. Ray, R-E-Y. It's written for children, but it's great for learning them. The other thing I like is this monthly sky maps at a website called skymaps.com. And yeah. it's got great information, and it's good for the early part of the evening. And I like it because the dot to dots on the stars are very good. And it gives you some easy-to-see objects to look at right on the map, where you wouldn't really even need um, a bigger map because of these are relatively bright things to look at. You do still need to get to a dark sky if you can um, for most things. I mean, Houston's losing everything but the brightest stars. But we're going to have Jupiter and Saturn yeah. up pretty soon. Okay. But Nor yeah. Norton's. Norton's. And also Stellarium is a very good computer atlas called Stellarium. S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M. So like yeah. Stellar with that. Yeah. And um, so that's a good one to recommend also. Okay. And there'll be a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, you you mentioned something astro card because the top was cut off where you see half and half through the yeah. eyepiece and, and the... I I could not find I know for a while they went away from paper to computer but when I look up astro card now I'm finding out finding like astrological sites I'm not even sure if they exist anymore yeah, I, I bought some from a vendor. I yeah you know, I would look maybe on eBay for them. I really like them, and I I have also bought a little holder for them where you slip in the card and there's a little red backlight because it's something I could hold right at the eyepiece. Often there's two or three objects on it, and it it is a reference I could use right at the eyepiece instead of going back and forth. Um, and I do like finding objects instead of using a computerized telescope that just finds it for you. So I like them because it's one small thing you could hold in your hand um, while you're actually at the eyepiece. And that was exactly what I was doing, looking through the eyepiece and then, then going, going back, and looking right? At yeah, that's like I forgot. Yeah, and here, this you <laughs> and and the, the holder is great. I, I, I should have gotten one of those because I spent years holding a red flashlight in my teeth, looking looking at my astro <laughs> card. But the worth investing in the holder with these is slip in the card and it's got a little red backlight on it. But that was really the best way when I was a new astronomer to find things. I, I still pull out my astro cards. They have them for double stars. After you run to the Messier objects, they have the best NGC objects, which are um, also pretty spectacular. And it's just so easy to pull out one card and work with it for a while. Is, is there an electronic version of it? There, there was, and that's why I was looking before my talk today. I was looking to see if I could find it if they, because the last time I bought them, it was like these are our last ones, and they're going mm -hmm. online only for you to print out. And so far, I could not call find them using the term Astro Cards today. Mm -hmm. um, if they, ex I'll see if I can find out whether they still exist, because I haven't found anything better than Astro Cards. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Debbie, hey, it's, a, it's Chris Shumate. Uh, excellent presentation as, as usual. Thank you very much. Uh, a quick question on Sky Safari. Uh, I've got a brand new iPhone and a brand new iPad, so I'm, I'm, I'm ready. So uh, I noticed you had Sky Safari 5 Pro, and I was looking around a little bit yesterday at Sky Safari, and it looks like there are about four or five different options. So if I'm just kind of jumping in right now, do you think that five pro is the way to go or maybe six I, or you know, I was just I was just looking for an image, so I don't even know what the most recent Sky Safari is right now. So I was just looking okay. for an image. Um, I would go I know that the pros have more features and I have Sky Safari or I had it on my previous phone. I wasn't I actually don't use computer atlases very much, so I haven't explored it very far. But like most of them, they're the kind of thing you can point at the sky and 
have get lots of information at what you're looking at if you point your phone at a constellation. I do like that about a lot of these atlases, and of course they have their own. Um, Maybe someone out there knows a little bit more about Sky for Safari, but a lot of these computerized atlases allow you to do things like figure out, um, customize for your eyepiece. If your eyepiece flips things upside down backwards, they allow you to do that. So um, computerized atlases will allow you to do a lot more than paper atlases will. I mean, I'm still doing those, like all those tests where you used to flip objects and, you know, which one's the same object. You have to do that a lot and astronomy when you're working only with paper atlases, but right. computer atlases okay. allow you to do a lot more. Someone out there might who uses yeah, I think, uh, Carl, uh, maybe Carl has. Yeah, can y'all hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Carl. Yeah, the, they've come out with version seven, finally for the uh, Android, and just last week I bought it, and it was on a 50% off, so I got it for $25 on the pro version. And you might as well spend whether it's twenty-five or fifty dollars and get the pro for version seven. It's available and has been out for the uh, iPhones for a few months, and now it's available with the uh, the Android. Uh, the reason to, to go ahead and get the pro it has a larger database, uh, and there is no upgrade path whether it's on uh, iPhone or the Android. If you buy the basic or the one that's in between, there's no upgrade from that to get the pro where you pay a reduced price, you just pay the full price again. And the five is probably, version five is probably four years to six years old, if not older. And so you might as well get the, the, the version seven with the largest database. There are some additional add-ons that you can uh, increase the size of that database uh, with some additional uh, ob you know, objects in it. And the cost for those are just a few dollars at a time. But you, you do, can get uh, version seven uh, at whatever level uh, from basic all the way up to pro for the iPhone and the Android now. Great. Thank you, Thank you Carl. Appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, Debbie. Yeah, and thanks for bringing that up. I didn't want to mention that it was just an image, not necessarily the latest model. Any other questions or comments? Any other terms I'm missing for like a version two someday? Polar alignment. Alignment, yeah, polar alignment. Mm -hmm. So we want to have a talk, of, we have one kind of about setting up the telescope as far as aligning finders and that sort of thing. But we are talking about doing more um, talks that will show how to do that. So, so for those who don't know, with an equatorial mount or any kind of telescope, which um, the way I like to explain it to kids is if you're on the North Pole, all you would have to do is stick the telescope on a turntable. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, let me take some water here. But the, the North Star would be directly overhead at the North Pole. And all the stars, they wouldn't be rising or setting, they'd be just going around you. So you would just have to stick a, a telescope on a turntable as the star is moving around you. You just have to put a motor that follows at exactly that speed. So as you come farther down the Earth and you have an equatorially mounted telescope, you need to get that, ba that base, the equivalent of what's up there on the North Pole. So you're tilting it so that it's basically what you're doing is you're making it parallel to the equator. And um, since they don't know when you buy those telescopes, whether you're in Houston or New York, they make that base movable. So you have to adjust it. So what you have to do is you work backwards. You have to um, put, make the telescope thinks it's going straight up on its base. And then you have to aim that at the North Star. Um, or something, the North Star is actually about three quarters of a degree off of the North Celestial Pole, but it's close enough. And so you, um, you make sure the base that the telescope is basing its motion on is, is uh, parallel to the equator and that when it thinks it's looking at 90 degrees up, it's actually looking at the North Star. Once you do that, then the telescope can use a single motor basically on a turntable and rotate it as if you were at the North Pole, except now instead your table being level, it's tilted. So that's polar alignment. And again, it's very important to make any kind of equatorially mounted telescope 
follow the sky if it has, oh, I forgot the term clock drive. So clock drive is, a tele, is the mechanism that telescopes use to, to uh, follow the star's path in the sky. So polar alignment and clock drive. In, in, De in Debbie, in your discussion, you use the word uh, obsolete, that the new go-to mounts uh, for the limited amount of weight that they can support, but it makes these other mounts, I mean, obsolete, but isn't it, isn't it just like just a different application? Yeah, I shouldn't say it makes them obs. Well, I remember when we talked about why you had the polar line, they said, well, it'd be so much more complicated to uh, have a, a, the problem of driving a telescope on two different axes was a problem. But these use GPS to, I'm not quite sure what the actual drive is, how that works, um, how it actually moves a telescope to follow an object. But uh, a lot of people, I don't actually like go-to telescopes because I don't like the setup you have to do, and I don't like having to type everything in when I can just take a Dobsonian yeah. and whip it over there. I can find, I mean, it's great, I guess, if you're doing a star party and it's pretty cloudy and uh, you're working with the public or you're looking for something quickly, you want to spend a lot more time writing down what you're looking at than finding it. But once I can find things, I can find them a lot faster with a Dobsonian than I can with a go-to where I have to take the time to type in what I'm looking at and then it slowly moves to the, to the object. I'm like, I want to grab the telescope, just whip it over there. Um, so there are pluses and minuses. I wouldn't say it makes the older ones obsolete, but it definitely, um, I, think it may, I think they're made a lot more, um, I've, usually the, you, have, you have to find an older telescope to get some of the older technology or Dobsonian as those are widely available. Yeah, well, well, really, thanks for all your presentations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thanks for being here, everybody. Um, yeah, I was, I didn't know whether I need to do a version two someday, but I, I've done this once before several years ago, and I thought, you know, this is really helpful just because of all these specialized terms. I remember learning these one at a time when I was a new astronomer. But this way, at least when people hear people just throwing out these terms, they'll at least have an an inkling of what people are talking about, and then they can learn more about it later. So if there's no more questions, I know this is kind of a long song. Uh, we'll um, hopefully see you next time. And I know there's a nice talk tomorrow by our member Larry Mitchell, the guy with the 36-inch telescope is especially good with uh, sort of history of astronomy talks. I, he'll be uh, excellent to listen to tomorrow night. Well, thank you very much. Hey, thanks, everybody. Thanks excellent for being job. here. Thank you. And this will thank be available later on. See you guys later. Bye. All right, all right, thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.